Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And, you know, Kevin, I was having you today, and I'll introduce you properly in a second. I was thinking of other SaaS companies that are interesting that I've had on. And in a second, I'm going to ask uh, Kevin about his favorite bootstrap SaaS companies. But some of the past ones I've had on the podcast are Pipedrive. Uh, Pipedrive is a really interesting story and they've grown. I think, Kevin, when I interviewed them, they had like 10,000 customers. Now I think they have over 100,000 or something. Wow. Wistia, Zapier was an interesting story on how Wade grew Zapier, Acuity Scheduling. Gavin is a, check out that interview. He is a master at conversions. He like just tested everything from the site. Um, and from onboarding, he found out there were some certain parts from a SaaS company, parts where people dropped off and he just zoned in on that, um, that churn and then basically put things in place to get yeah. people past that point. And he was a master at it. Um, and SEM Rush also and many more. So check out other episodes. Before I introduce Kevin, this episode is brought to you by Rise25 at Rise25. We help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships um, by helping you run your podcast. So we are the easy button for businesses to launch and run your podcast. And, you know, Kevin, for me, relationships are the number one thing in my life. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I've been doing that for over 10 years and profiling the people that I admire. I love what they're doing, sharing their thought leadership with the world on my podcast. So if you have thought about anyone has thought about starting a podcast or you want strategy around your podcast, you can contact us, go to rise25.com. I am excited to introduce today's guest. Big shout out to Marcel Petipa, co-founder of Parakeeto. He helps digital agencies run more profitably. He introduced me to today's guest, Kevin. Thank you, Marcel. He's awesome. Just a great individual. And, um, Kevin McArdle is the founder and CEO of SureSwift Capital, uh, which is a private equity firm that buys and builds SaaS companies. And they have bought over 30 companies in the past five and a half years. Um, I love your tagline, Kevin. SureSwift gives dream access to SaaS founders. Hey, that cuts through everything, right? Yeah, we like they, to keep it pretty simple. I love it. Uh, you know, they've cut the frustration and confusion out of the purchase process. And a few of their companies include Charge Stripe, Mail Parser, My Site Otter, and many more. You could check out their website, you know, SureSwift Capital. Um, prior to founding SureSwift, Kevin was vice president at Cerner Corporation, which was a global healthcare IT firm. Um, for 15 years. And it looks like you probably held every possible, almost every possible position in that company. Uh, I didn't see janitor on there, but sales, leadership, operations, general management. It looks like you just acquired all these skill sets. Like, what can I do with this? And you started SureSwiftCapital.com. So Kevin, thanks for joining me. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for that very detailed and thorough uh introduction i can't write any code so that's at the top of the list of jobs <laughs> i never held at cerner nor nor at Shursla. i want to hear you know i asked you i said in the beginning your favorite bootstrap companies before you answer that though tell me the transition your point of decision of obviously you were at that company for 15 years it was a big mm -hmm. part of your life your decision to leave there and what you were going to do next um, well, I'll try to give you a succinct version of that story, but as you can imagine, it was, it was a big decision and it, um, it was really over the course of about a year, uh, the thinking about different things and deciding, and there were two sort of, uh, key factors in that decision. Um, the first one was I had other opportunities presented to me. Um, and you know, one, uh, you know, there was a, a physician who was a friend of mine who wanted to create a medical device company. And he thought, you know, his expertise compared with my business sense would be a good combination. And we, we actually went down the path of exploring, like, would that make sense for both of us? And it really started, you know, I'd always dreamed about owning my own business, but that really got the wheels turning in earnest about like, is now the right time? Is this the right opportunity? Am I ready? And that sort of thing. Um, at the same time, a competitor to Cerner was, you know, luring me to, you know, try to 
change teams and, and go work for them. So that again, started me thinking like, okay, well, there's no reason why I can't go do something else. Um, and then at the, uh, the, the third thing was, well, I sorry, along with those like other opportunities, um, you know, the idea of SureSwift was presented to me as another way to start a business and, you know, do my own thing. So all these things were kind of, you know, in my head all at once and, you know, creating a little bit of pressure to make a decision to either double down on Cerner or do one of these other three options. And then how was, was that in, presented to you? The sure swift option. Uh, that seems so, like an outlier. The other ones seem kind of, I could see that, but why sure swift that, that well, it, it wasn't, it wasn't that different than the doctor who had it, who was an entrepreneur and he, he was running a successful pharmaceutical company at the time. And he had this idea and he knew this is a really good business idea, but he didn't have the time to run it. So, you know, I don't know if he was looking, talking to other people besides me, but it was like, okay, you know, Kevin has abilities. I have an idea, you know, let's team up and go do this thing. The sure Swift was the same thing. You know, the guy who was my co-founder um, had the idea, but didn't have the time to go do it. And, you know, I had actually asked him for advice about this medical device thing. And, you know, it was in that con context of that conversation. He's like, well, you know, I actually have an idea too. That's a little bit less risky than the medical device thing. Maybe you should consider that. So, at the time, it didn't feel like an outlier, um, but I could I could see where it, it does. It, it's not a natural. Nothing that's happened in the last six years feels at all linear to me, even if I explain it to people. So, um, the the other the other big thing that sort of cemented it for me was, and I, by the way, I love my career at Cerner, and I'm still friends with a lot of the people there, and I, it's a great company. Uh, so there was nothing negative going on, but um, I I was invited to a, a client event where um, there were maybe 200 people total and maybe you know, three quarters of more clients and a quarter were you know, my, my teammates, Cerner Associates. And it was um, generally people above me on the org chart. And so people that I worked with for a long time, they had bigger jobs, they were somewhere between me and the CEO and um, people I respected. And I, I kind of was looking around at cocktail hour at all these people and I'm like, okay, I know what her job is and I don't want that job. And I know what that guy's job is and I don't want that job. And this other guy, I definitely don't want his job. And so I, I kind of got myself thinking like, okay, well, you know, and they're all like in line ahead of me to like the biggest jobs at Cerner. Um, and so it just got me, well, if, if I'm kind of, it felt like I had kind of run its course where it was becoming less and less interesting to move up the corporate ladder in that space. And what was becoming more and more interesting was like stepping off that that ladder or the corporate treadmill and really taking a chance on on something else. Um, and so in talking about it at length with my wife and other mentors and friends, just describing the different opportunities, I could feel myself getting really excited about doing something new and different in my own business. And when I described either continuing at Cerner or going to a competitor, I just didn't, my heart didn't, you know, get beating as fast. And so over that long period of time of thinking and talking about it and, you know, going like really trying to explore the different opportunities, it, it just became clear that, you know, now is the time to, you know, step off that treadmill and do something different. You know, we were talking before we hit record about really you want to highlight entrepreneurship. You know, and I'm curious, so what did life look like at that time? Married, kids, because it, you know, I want to know that decision making process because it would have been easy, easier probably just to stay and do what you're do what you've done for the past oh, 15 yeah. years. So what did life look like at that time when you were making that decision? Um, it was it was scary in a lot of ways and safe in some others. So um, it was scary. like any entrepreneur knows it's scary because like you don't know if it's going to work out. I told some friends and family I was going to start my own thing. And some of them looked at me like I was crazy. And that never feels good when people you like and respect think you're crazy. Um, I, we really trimmed back our expenses. Like I sold my car and, you know, was mainly a bicycle commuter for two years. Um, I did, we, you know, had four kids and a mortgage and, you know, didn't trim back those expenses, but... <laughs> Yeah, you can't. Um, that's a tough one to trim back. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so those things were all scary, and there were times where like things were going great, and there were times where it wasn't going great. And if, you know, I was wondering like, am I am I going to have to you know go back to my corporate job with my tail between my legs and admit that I failed? 
Um, and there were some ways that it was safe. You know, my wife and I have always lived below our means and we had, you know, saved up a pretty nice nest egg. Um, I happened to be living in Canada at the time where I you know, was able to you know, take advantage of the public health care system, which was an expense that I know for a lot of entrepreneurs, that is a meaningful blocker in the U.S. for people taking the leap and trying something new because, you know, if you're not employed, you know, health care can be you know, pretty expensive here. And that's something that I hope I, we see change in my lifetime in some way. I don't have the answer, but, you know, it's, it's a shame that, you know, that real expense can, can keep people from pursuing the dream or starting a company. Um, but, you know, basically my wife and I talked about it at length, did the math and had the spreadsheet. It was like, okay, we got two years of runway and that's enough time to figure out, you know, A, do I love it as much as I think I'm going to? B, is it going to provide for a family the same or better than the corporate career? You know, and C, is the idea of going to work? Like we had to, we had to figure all those things out. Fortunately, you know, pretty early on, we started checking off those boxes and ended up being the right decision. I mean, I guess worst case scenario, you go back to the job. I mean, if they'll have you back, you go back to the position, right? Yeah. And I did make that sound like it would be an embarrassing, sad thing. But I also know, yeah, that wouldn't have been terrible. You know, I, I was leaving a place that I liked working and I was being recruited by other people that I liked and respected to work at another really great company. Um, those options weren't going to evaporate after yeah. two years. And in my opinion, and I know this is shared by other people in corporate America, I probably would have been a more valuable team member going back to that company, having been an entrepreneur, you know, because you learn different skills, you flex different muscles, you, you know, challenge yourself in different ways. And so, you know, while I wouldn't have been excited to do that, I knew, you know, if we hit the end of that two year runway and it didn't work out, it wasn't like I was going to be without options for employment. Mm -hmm. So what, you know, favorite bootstrap companies and, and why, what are some yeah. of your favorites? So, um, I, I'll tell you two that come to mind and I'm not going to list off a bunch because there, there are some, <laughs> the term bootstrap has become a little bit controversial. Um, there are some people that are like, if you ever take money from anybody, you can't call yourself a bootstrapper. I do not subscribe to that, but there are some very large, you know, relatively well-known companies that are, you know, kind of put forward as bootstrap, but they actually did take money in the past. It's just, they don't highlight that. Um, but two, two of my favorites that your listeners may not know of, but they should. Uh, the first one is a software company called Wildbit. They're based in Philadelphia, founded by a husband and wife team, Chris and Natalie Miguel. They just celebrated 20 years in business, which just seems like an eternity for, you know, a, a, a bootstraps. There's, they're relatively small. I, you know, I want to say they have less than 30 team members, but um, have created three amazing products and, you know, have, have, I really respect the way that they have built their business, which they, they're proudly say is people first. You know, they, they've made a bunch of money for themselves and for their team, but they've always focused on their people first. So Wildbit is a good one to check out. Um, and another one, I don't know the founder as well, but I, I, I do know him a little bit. The, the company's called Balsamic. And if any of your listeners are in the tech industry, they, they are more likely to have heard for, for, about Balsamic. It's like a wireframe software. Like, so if you're designing something, it helps you to kind of sketch it out and, and envision it really quick and easily, and then use that to kind of evolve your designs. And the founder of that company is a guy named Pelby who uh, lives in Italy. Um, he built his company remote first long before anybody believed that that was possible or a good idea. Um, I want to say he's been in business now for 12 years and, you know, all bootstrapped his own, you know, funded on the revenue from customers. Um, and, you know, it just seems universally respected in the circles that I run in and of software CEOs and, and other tech folks. So those two companies are ones that, um, I, I just really respect the, the founders and the way that they've built their businesses and, and might be a little bit below the radar from, you know, the, the, the typical you know, hit list that you, you, you might think of. I want to highlight some of the ones in your portfolio also, but um, I also want to mention one of my other favorite interviews with Rob Walling, um, who runs MicroConf and yeah. he, uh, you've probably, I imagine probably been to his conference. I mean, that's when I think of, Who's bringing these people together? Who's a leader in the space? I immediately think of Rob Walling. 
For sure. And I, I think he's one of the, and, and his uh, co-founder of uh, MicroConf is a guy named Mike, and um, who's a little less in the in the public sphere than Rob. But yeah, Rob and I have become friends because yes, attended MicroConf, uh, shared a lot of common ground. We now live in the same city and our kids actually went to school in the same place for, for a year or two. Um, and he definitely is uh, was one of the earliest people that I stumbled upon. Um, you know, when, when started SureSwift, it was, as you can imagine, like breaking into a whole new industry. I didn't know anything about anything. So I just started trying to learn. And um, Rob and his podcast and MicroConf were some of the early ones that kind of struck the chords. Like, oh, there's this whole community of people that are doing things a very different way than what you you read about in TechCrunch or the Wall Street Journal. At what point do you decide bootstrapped SaaS? It the wasn't year. so much a decision as it was a trend. You know, mm -hmm. we started acquiring businesses and the ones that looked the best to us. And, and from the beginning, the thesis of SureSwift was let's acquire profitable internet based businesses. Full stop. Uh, there wasn't like, okay, we're going to go into FinTech or education or SMB, you know, SaaS. But as we started looking at opportunities and, and making acquisitions, we kept getting drawn to these companies that started to look very similar. Mm. And it turned out they were just, what what we what we were drawn to is the profitability, and the, the 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 way that they were built on sustainable methods, not buying traffic, not paying a super expensive sales team that has to close every deal. Um, so it was more it it was um, it it was more just like recognizing a pattern and then going after that pattern a little bit more aggressively. I love that. Is you look you're like, you know, because usually patterns emerge and we're not paying attention to them. So I like how you went back. All of us should be doing that with all of our customers or clients or whatever and saying, what is the pattern who we like working with the most that are the most successful, the, the most profitable, all of those things. And you saw that pattern in that. Yeah. Um, so what are the criteria? What are you looking for when you're, so if you're a SaaS company out there and you're like, this sounds awesome. I need to check out SureSwift Capital. I want to sell. Um, or you know of someone who has a SaaS company. I'm going to let Kevin lay out what they're looking for. Um, so you can see if, if you kind of fit this criteria. Yeah, to, to very simply, I'll give you some guardrails. But if somebody if, you know is interested, I'm happy to connect, even if they feel like they're outside the guardrails. So like we say bootstrapped, but that's not a hard, like if you've taken a little bit of money, that's fine. But again, before we were talking, like if you're taking a bunch of venture capital money, your investor's expectation of return is not going to match what we're going to pay for a business because I, you know, it, it might have gone to the realm of unrealistic. Um, so yeah, generally bootstrapped. Generally, if you're making 20K a month in MRR and up with, you know, no real top limit, um, we're interested. Uh, you have to be profitable. Um, but you know, if you're 20% profits, you know, I'm, I'm listening. If you're 50% or more, like I'm, I'm getting really interested. Um, and, uh, beyond that, like software as a service, it's a, it's a big wide net. We purposely don't hone in on a, on a single, um, industry. We are tech stack agnostic, you know, so, um, regardless of what code language or what hosting platform you've built on, like we can accept, you know, just about anything. Um, and yeah, in, in another, you know, I'm happy to hear from people who think they might want to sell or they have a friend who might be willing to sell, but I'm also happy to hear from people that are just like, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm trying to figure stuff out. Can you help? Can you give advice? You know, we, we uh, have purposely put out a lot of, um, content and marketing materials that are just sort of like, we've learned a lot of stuff. Let's try to share some of that knowledge with the world and help other entrepreneurs assuming that 99.9% .9 of them will never sell to us. But if it helps them create a better business, then that's a, still a good outcome. What about, what are you looking for in the team? Um, well, we talk about founder fit a lot on our team, which seems not intuitive because the typical structure is we do hundred percent buyout. So the founder has decided he or she is ready to sell. Now's the right time. And, you know, we ask them to help us transition the business so we don't lose any ground, but then they, you know, sell 100% of the company and ride off into the sunset or go move on to their next project. Um, so even though we, we don't, aren't going to have a formal working relationship, they're not going to be employed by SureSwift, I have learned the hard way that um, 
businesses take on the personality of their founder for better and for worse. Um, and so that then the next level down from that that I learned the hard way is if there's something about the founder that I don't like or the team doesn't like or they just seem um, non-trustworthy, we hit the brakes and the deal gets off. Um, because we're, without knowing, if, if I get the sense that somebody's not trustworthy, there's something wrong with their business and I just haven't found it yet. Um, and they're probably actively trying to hide it from me. So founder fit is important and it's sort of this a subjective thing. We, we want to do business with people that we know, that we like, and that we feel like we can trust. Because even though there won't be a formal working relationship, you know, anybody who follows me on Twitter knows that I'm, I love to celebrate the people that have sold businesses to us long after, you know, the, the formal contractual, you know, relationship has ended. Um, beyond that, like an ideal scenario, the founder has added a team, which isn't always the case. We bought from solo founders before. Um, I don't recommend that for anybody. I think, you know, once you've gotten to a certain scale, you should absolutely try to hire to replace the tasks that are um, less strategic. Uh, but not everybody likes that. Some people just like working alone and, and being in charge of everything they do. But we really love when a founder has hired a team to sort of replace themselves in the day to day. And we um, almost always bring that team along if they're willing to come with, with the, the business. So we all, almost always offer people um, a job at SureSwift that's equivalent to or better than the job that they, they had with the founder. Um, and, but, you know, we don't, we don't need a huge team size, again, following patterns, almost every business we bought has been remote, which fits our culture as an organization. Cause we've been remote first from the beginning. Um, but if, if somebody has an office, like I, especially in, you know, in the current state, I scratch my head at that a little bit, but it's not, a, it's not a deal breaker. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of what we look for in a team. I mean, Kevin, when I was when I was watching some uh, you you speak before you you talked about different reasons people sell, and it was interesting because you said you know some of these people they like you mentioned they may be solo or they may have several team members, and you talked about how a developer went in because they like what they're doing they thought it was a cool product but when you start building the team you you have a different job and that's not what they started the business to do so i imagine people are growing the team maybe stop maybe i don't know do you find that they start enjoying what they're doing less because now they're doing more management than what they originally started doing or is that not a big reason why people sell well i I think it's a factor i don't think i don't think anybody is going to go sell a business because they don't like managing people because if you've got a big successful business you know, uh, profits solve a lot of frustrations, right? Um, and you know, to, you you can you can do things to make that easier on yourself. Hire people that don't need a lot of day to day management. You know, that's a simple one. Um, but so so there are you know, looking at trends in our in our portfolio, there are a lot of founders who have shared like they got into the 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 often a side project. They wrote the code because they it was a side project. They wanted to make a little extra cash. And fast forward three, four, five, seven years, all of a sudden they're managing a small team of people. They're not writing code anymore. They're, they're dealing with customers, they're dealing with partnerships, and it's just not their ideal thing. Um, that said, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily the top reason why people sell, but it, it's a factor for a lot of people because having a successful business gives you optionality. You have the option to keep growing that business. You have the option to hire a CEO to replace yourself and you still own it, but you don't have to do the work. You have the option to sell the business. Um, and so, you know, the, depending on the person, where they are in their stage of life, what else they've got going on, whether they've got the next idea, often people have the next business idea that they would rather go work on, or they may have even started the next side project that needs their attention. So, um, you know, if every business is tied to an individual or a couple of individuals who are the founders, like no two people are the same. And so no two stories are the same, but that is a trend that we see a lot. Like people can grow a business to, a, to, to some level and they either hit a ceiling to where it, it be, you need a different skill set to continue to grow it. Or, and, and, you know, some people can evolve and grow into that skill set. I've certainly grown into you know being a different type of CEO today than I was 
four or five years ago, some people aren't interested in that. You know, that a lot of people that we buy from, they, they call, they consider themselves makers or creators. Um, and if they're not creating something new, they feel like they're not, you know, kind of exercising their, their best self. And so, you know, all these things, um, go into sort of a, the decision process to, to sell a business. And, you know, but my, my point in talking through all that is like, if you've never gone through the process, you might think it's all, it's a, just about the money, like just about the, how big of a check can I get? And I just like to sort of caution people or remind people that, you know, the difference of, you know, 10 or 20% on a check may, might feel good, but there's a whole bunch of other factors that go into selling the business. You got to decide, is it the right time for you? What are you going to do next? Who's going to take over your, your business or your baby and like do something great with it and, and make you proud that you sold to that group or that individual. And so, you know, it's just, it's not just about like, I want money. So I'm going to sell my business. Kevin, when you look at the next year, do you have a goal as a company? We want to acquire X number of businesses this next year. Or um, what was your focus? Because, I mean, you could, you know, focus in and you have a number of amazing portfolio companies and then, I mean, but it is what you do acquiring. What do you, what are your thoughts around that growth versus growth outside versus growth inside? With so what you're growth, growth we're, we're, I like to think we're a pretty disciplined organization. And th some of that's for my Cerner career, like measure everything, monitor everything. If a, if a metric is out of line, you know, dig in and find out why. Make sure you got the right people working on the right things. Like these are just the way I was brought up in business, and that applies to SureSwift. So growing the existing portfolio is absolutely a top priority. Acquiring new businesses is absolutely also a top priority, but that is a hard goal to set and to measure against, and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, if we say we want to acquire, you know, fifty million dollars of companies over the next two years, then you can do the math and kind of chop that up into quarters, and you know what your your goal for the quarter, and you can know if you're ahead or behind schedule. Um, and then it can get a little complicated because okay, you could do two deals for twenty five million each, and then you hit fifty million, but you know those those are pretty risky. Or you could do five deals for ten million each, or you know, uh, 25 deals for two million. So, you know, you kind of do that math, but you're also at the mercy of the market to some degree, right? So like for us to acquire a business, we have to find a, a seller who's willing to sell and for it to be a fit. We're a fit for them and their business is a fit for us. And so it happens where a quarter goes by and we don't do any deals and you have to be okay with that because if you're not okay with that, then you start making mistakes and you start getting a little too anxious and you start overlooking problems in a business that you would otherwise just to meet a goal that just you to have. meet a, a somewhat arbitrary goal. And so it's frustrating to me because I love setting goals and I love having spreadsheets and I love seeing, you know, the little data points on that spreadsheet lining up with, you know, forecast meets actual, right? But when it comes to acquisitions, you know, I've just learned I have to accept that there may be slow periods where we don't find a fit and you have to be okay with that. But then there are also times where like, I think there was a two month period where we, where we bought five businesses in two months, which isn't ideal, but they were all great companies that fit what we were looking for. And so we, we made it work. Um, and so, yeah, we, we do have internal goals that we talk about with acquisitions, because if we're not acquiring, we're not really fulfilling, you know, what we've set out to do, but we also have to kind of be okay with um, things going faster or slower than we expect. Kevin, what were some of the mistakes early on? I'm sure, I'm sure like if anyone goes to your website, they can go to sureswiftcapital.com and there's a great page that is, you know, lays out the founder journey, all right? And you can see seller does this, we do this, seller does this, we do this. I'm sure when you first started, you didn't have this laid out pretty like this. And also the entire process takes three to eight weeks, four to six typical. I mean, it's very, you know, it, it's broken down by system. Yeah. Talk about in the beginning, what got you to this? Some of the mistakes maybe you made. made. There was no system at all. <laughs> um, there's a lot of trial and error. Um, 
the beginning, it was just me trying to figure this stuff out. So I poured through as many um, prospectuses and deal memos that I could see from brokers, tried to look for the right patterns of things I liked and things I didn't, just tried to learn. I tried to talk to as many people as I could who were in a similar business. I tried to learn from podcasts and other people's content who were, you know, a few steps ahead of me. Um, the, the, big, the biggest lesson learned in all this, Jeremy, and it's one that like, I shouldn't have had to learn it a second time because I learned this over and over earlier in my career, but people make all the difference. And the reason that there is this very disciplined process and we've gotten very good at finding the right businesses and very good at making it a good experience for the seller and making it efficient, but not too fast. Um, and being able to process literally hundreds of opportunities in any given month or quarter, it's all because I've been able to build a team of amazing people that understand every aspect of the business. Um, you know, we have a team of people that just focuses on acquisitions all the time. We've got our finance and accounting people who can pour over every detail, our technical folks who can, you know, bet the tech stack and, and, and look for any, any risks. Our marketing and growth teams can look for risks and opportunities. And I, fortunately, um, this may sound weird for me to say, but the more removed I am from the details of that process, the better the process has become. Because I've got people who are experts in every one of those functions doing better than me looking at that function than I could have possibly done when I was the only person looking at it. So. And some, some of the growth of that team, it, you, you require some, some profits and some revenue to hire all these senior people. Um, but in terms of like mistakes made, I wish I had invested more in people to help me with acquisitions mm. a lot earlier. Talk about the evolution of the team. So, because it goes from you and then who are the key hires that you had to bring in first, second, third to actually put these pieces in place? Yeah, so um, I mentioned early days, we said we're going to go acquire profitable internet-based businesses. Software wasn't a requirement at the early days. So, and what, what I found was there are a lot of um, content websites, you know, you know, websites that mainly make money through advertising of one form or another that uh, you know, were super profitable, didn't require a whole lot of time to run them. So went and acquired several of those, I mean, say half a dozen. Um, and whenever, you know, I, I think I mentioned earlier, when there is a team involved, our default is let's hire the team, assume that they are smart and talented and hardworking until they prove otherwise. But it's easier to just transition somebody's, you know, who's paying them than to find new team members to replace them, if that makes sense. So you know, we make some acquisitions and, and they're mostly content. So we've got all of a sudden a bunch of uh, team members, contractors mostly, who are writing the content. There are people who are sort of SEO experts. There are people who are sort of design experts. So the first person I hired into SureSwift that wasn't tied to a portfolio company was a woman to manage that, that group of people, manage the content, manage the schedule so that I didn't have to think about that so much. Um, as we evolved then, you know, there, there's some other, other people along the way, but as far as key hires, there is, we're, we're managing a portfolio, you know, flash, you know, forward a little bit, you know, now we've got a dozen separate individual businesses that all have their own hosting needs and everything's got, you know, dozens of other technical components making them work with whether it's content or software. And I hired uh, somebody to be vice president of technology to just manage all of that because that's the part of this business that is the biggest black hole for me. I'm not a technical person. Fortunately, I found somebody who was amazing and he just came in and organized everything for as far as hosting, making sure everything was up and live and running optimally. At that point, Kevin, were you looking at hitting a revenue number or number of company number before bringing on, because a senior person like that probably costs more, I mean, in general, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, to be honest, Jeremy, it was more about like looking at the pains in the business, like both me personally, where I was losing sleep or where I felt like I was failing and then trying to solve for that pain. And then thinking about like, okay, what's the right level of expertise and salary that we can afford. But I didn't, I wasn't sitting there looking at a spreadsheet saying, okay, as soon as we get to X revenue, then we can hire the person. Um, and so, 
you know, it was more just like constantly evaluating the business and thinking, where do we need to upgrade the team? Where do we need to plug the hole? Uh, and we've gotten a, a lot more disciplined at that. But you know, any, any entrepreneur would probably tell you, like, it's a mess, especially at the, at the early days. You're just trying to survive and keep moving forward and keep doing more good things than bad things. Um, and so I would be lying to you if I told you there was a, a really, like, thoughtful scientific process of like how and when to hire people or when to let people go. Like when you're losing sleep that night, you should be yeah. hiring someone for that. <laughs> Write that down and make some phone calls the next day. Your stomach is hurting really bad because you just have this pain. Okay. Sign yeah. you should hire. It's time. Yeah. yeah. So VP of tech, what was next yeah. key? Then I started bringing in, so by this time we've acquired a couple of software businesses and I was, I did not have the time to really manage the day to day of the, the people running the businesses or the strategy. And so we started hiring, this was a key, you know, sort of um, evolution of sure. So it was having like proper business people to manage every single company. And, you know, a lot of, especially in the early days, the businesses that we acquired didn't didn't need a GM or a CEO to run them. Uh, certainly some of our businesses now are big enough that, yeah, we need a proper CEO to manage the team and manage the P&L and all those things. But earlier earlier days, we could hire somebody as more of a product manager or a general manager that could look after two or three different businesses at once. And as we started adding those people, we saw better results from the portfolio companies. Uh, we were able to more smoothly transition them in. And then we just continued to build out all roles really but as far as like roles that didn't come from an acquisition it was those business people managing every single portfolio company and thinking about it every day freed my time up to work on SureSwift itself continue to work on acquisitions um and and know and trust that somebody really smart and talented and better than i could ever be at running a software company was thinking about each portfolio company every day i'm wondering kevin you know you mentioned you know, we all stand on the shoulders of giants, people before us and um, advice you got from a similar type of company, but maybe in a different industry. And you mentioned someone who I think I was listening. It was a pool company or something like that, that does oh, something know, similar yeah. Yeah. to you, but they in a different industry. Can you talk about the advice they gave you? And then any other people that have given you advice that do something similar in, in a different industry? Yeah, well, one, um, one simple piece of advice that I think about almost every week was um, one of my mentors when I was leaving Cerner, and I explained to him what I was going to go do. And he could see, like, he and I had worked together enough. He's like, okay, I, I, I'm convinced this will be successful. I don't know what it's going to look like, but you may be doing this if it's successful for the rest of your life. So make sure you are building the company that you want to work at. You know, because we can all look at our past employers and be like, well, this sucked. And I didn't like this part of the culture and they should have done this. And he's like, you're the boss. So if anything sucks, it's your fault. And you should be thinking about that right now. What is the company that you want to work for in five years and 10 years? And that has really stuck with me. And I'm, I'm really thankful that he did give me that advice. I think the person you're referring, I know the person you're referring to is a guy named Brent Bishore. And he has a similar business to mine because it's a portfolio of businesses that he has acquired. His are all in the offline space, pool company, glass company, recruiting firms, um, nothing to do with technology. So, and he's just a wonderful person. And he and I hit it off because we could sort of swap ideas without the risk of it, like giving away any sort of secret sauce to a competitor. Like we, we later found out we did compete on one specific deal, but it was a, a really weird circumstance. It was after the fact. Um, and the, the great, so there are a lot of things that I've learned from Brent. He's very generous as a human. He also puts out just tons of content in terms of podcasts and newsletters. And he, you know, publicizes his annual letter to shareholder or to investors. Um, and he's been gracious to give me lots of different pieces of advice along the way. And he's always like five years ahead of where I am. So I get to learn from his successes and, and mistakes. Who else in the industry, Kevin, do you follow or have, you know, really um, as a colleague been, you know, brainstorming? Maybe, you know, s similar, same thing with Brent, like similar, they have portfolio companies, but maybe a different industry than 
than bootstrap SaaS? You know, other than Brent, like people, there, there are a lot of people that either have portfolio companies of software, like internet based businesses. And the, the conversations just don't go as well because there's always this, like, you don't want to share too much and I don't expect them to share too much. Um, but another, uh, another person who's become a really great relationship is actually a guy who sold me a business. His name's Tyler Tringus and he, um, built a company called store mapper, built it with a remote team, uh, removed himself from the, the, you know, the day to day. And, you know, a lot of the, the patterns that we see of things we like, he fits a lot of those patterns. He's just a, like founder fit. He's a, he's a really good human treats people really well. Um, and I uh, was very transparent and open and honest about his business, like the, the good things and the flaws. And that's really, you know, nice when you're looking to acquire something. Um, and so he sold us a business. We continued to remain friends and talk. Um, he went and did a couple other things that didn't work out. And now he has launched his own fund where he, the te- it's called Ernest Capital to give him and Ernest a shout out. The tagline is funding for bootstrappers, which is sort of an intentional oxymoron to like break the notion. Exactly. That's to be funny. a bootstrapper doesn't mean you can't ever take any money. Hmm. The thesis that Tyler had, which I think was really insightful based on his own experience and a ton of people that he knew that were bootstrapping and part of that micro comp community that you've mentioned. Um, for a lot of people, it's a side hustle or they're doing consulting work because the, the software business that they really love and are passionate about isn't paying the bills. And he thought back to his own experience and others. He's like, well, what if, what if I could just, what if I could have just raised a hundred thousand dollars? And I think his, his experience was he put like 50 grand in credit card debt, you know, personally into his own business, which is super scary and nobody should ever do that. But he thought like, what, what if I could just get a little bit of money and then build a profitable business? And so he's built the whole thesis around earnest capital for that. And it's been incredibly successful. Yeah. You know, so, so he and I sort of brainstorm. I ask his advice on what we're doing at SureSwift. He asked my advice early days before Ernest Capital even had a name or, a, you know, working documents. SureSwift became the first anchor investor in Ernest Capital because I believed in it. And I wanted it to succeed and I believed in him. And so we talk very frequently. We were just on Slack yesterday, kind of, again, catching up and, you know, helping one another. We've since co-created a community called Founder Summit that um, is a way for, to bring people together in a low ego environment to share ideas and help entrepreneurs build better businesses. Um, and so that's a relationship that um, never, never imagined it would evolve to that space, but just because we get along and, you know, um, personally and share a lot of common beliefs about life and business, it's, it's been a really, you know, uh, outstanding relationship you know, that's going on in five years now. Well, it's a great partnership too. It's like you have these SaaS companies, he helps them, then they sell to you. It's, it's a perfect ecosystem. There you well, go. Well, it hasn't happened yet. Okay. And the, 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 it's a matter of time. It's are not... under no obligation yeah. to sell the shirts. But I, I think, and I hope it's a matter of time. Yeah. He funds a company. It goes really well. The founder has all those options that we talked about and they, they opt to sell to SureSwift. That would be a huge home run. It's not why we got into it together, but um, but yeah, that, that would be sort of a dream come true in a great yeah. story. It's a natural progression, uh, one of them. Um, mm-hmm. So I want you to walk through a little bit in in the last few minutes we have about um, one an example from your discussion to actually you know buying the company to afterwards and. Um, we were talking at, uh, before about mail parser. Yeah, that's a good. Example. How did you first discover mail parser? Um, mail parser, I first discovered via a broker, which um, is is rarely the case anymore because we have more of a brand and people know where to find us if they're thinking of selling a business. But mail parser came through a broker, a broker that I had worked with before and had built up some trust with, um, and we. You know, first you're just looking at a 20 page document and digging the details and there were certain things that popped like it was super profitable, had a team in place, you know, low churn. It's a type of business that it's for their customers. If everything goes according to plan, you sort of set it and forget it. And there's no reason for the customer to ever think about changing or removing the software. Um, And then, you know, I, we got, I got on the phone with Moritz Dowsinger, who's the, the gentleman who built the company. 
and just had a great conversation. You know, I, I, I asked him some things about the business. I asked him things about the, you know, how do you have the idea in the beginning? You know, typical conversation, just trying to learn about the business, learn about him. And, you know, he's just a remarkable guy that I really enjoyed um, talking with. And the business was growing really fast. And so um, what, you know, what we had to figure out was like, what's the right valuation is part of any, any conversation. But um, so, you know, fast forward, we agree upon a price. I asked Moritz to help us transition the business. One of the reasons he was selling was, you know, if you look at our portfolio page, as you've seen, Jeremy, there's another one that's called Doc Parser. And it's not a coincidence that those have similar names and similar logos because Moritz built both of them. And so Mail Parser was doing really well. And Doc Parser was like a new idea that wasn't making as much money, but he wanted to dedicate all his time to that. And so um, I tried to talk him into selling me both businesses at once. And he said, no, 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 Kevin McArdle, because <laughs> Doc Parser is going to be worth more someday. And he was right. So anyway, fast forward to the end. We, we bought Mel Parser. Go, going back to the team, this is, I love this story. Um, Moritz had hired two people to sort of replace him. Uh, there was a guy named Joshua who was doing customer support for him. And there was a guy named Tom who was doing marketing like half time for him. And Moritz was still writing most of the code. So that business, I think we bought almost five years ago. I may have the date a little bit off. Joshua is still with us today and has grown into an even more senior role as a customer happiness specialist. We use the term customer happiness because I feel like it sets a higher bar than customer support. And Tom proved to be a very talented guy in terms of growth and marketing and business and being a leader of people. And he's now on our about page. He's our vice president of product. So he went from... When Moritz sold me the business, Tom got a little spooked. So he started getting other clients and he's like, <laughs> Kevin, I'll work for you like 10 hours a week and let's just see how it goes. And now, you know, five years later, he's, you know, a very trusted member of my leadership team and is managing all of the people that manage the portfolio. Um, so that's, that was sort of a, a dream come true for me. It was a great result for Moritz. Otherwise, he wouldn't have sold me Doc Purser two years later. And, you know, he and I remain friends to this day. He's one of my favorite humans in the ecosystem. I'm sure all of the process takes a little bit different time. What was uh, the time, average time for those two from when you first discussed to actually acquiring? I, I think the time period for mail presser was probably from the first time I heard about it till, you know, we had a letter of intent signed where we knew we were going to you know, acquire the business. That was probably two to three months. Um, Doc Parser was two years, you know, because I knew he was building the business. He, we, he, we were chatting about like continued transition of mail parser and I would ask his advice or he, if he saw a competitor do something, he'd be like, Hey, look out for this or, you know, whatever. Just, we built a very great working relationship that went beyond his contractual obligations. And I think we went above and beyond our contractual obligations too. And every once in a while I check in and just be like, how's Doc Parser going? You know, Hey, you know, what do you think? Are you thinking about selling? And, you know, so it was over a long period and never any pressure, of course, because he could sell it to anybody who wanted to. But um, so we talked about it for a while and because we had a really good experience with mail parser, but there were some things where he's like, you know, it might make sense to do things a little bit differently for Doc Purser. And because I, I knew he wasn't in a hurry, I wasn't in a hurry, we just let that sort of negotiation process take as long as it needed until we had a deal structure that made sense and he was ready. So yeah, kind of kind of weird, two months for the first one and two years for the second one, yeah. both great results. Kevin, first of all, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone should check out SureSwiftCapital.com. Check out SureSwiftCapital.com slash portfolio. You could see the amazing businesses they have there, Doc Parser, Mail Parser, Pay Dirt. You know, we didn't get to talk about Back in Stock, which is a Shopify app that notifies user when a product is back in stock. E-commerce is, is hot right now and probably will be for the you know foreseeable future. Um, Flyer Heroes, there's a bunch of other ones, Workbase. Check it out. And um, I want to be the first one to thank you, Kevin, and check out other episodes, check out their website, check out Rise25. And thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side.
See, life's like a beach if you find the sand And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand 